What's up, all my nieces, nephews, and non-binary nibblings? This is another episode of Five Up, Five Down here on Uncle Cardboard's Limited Jamboree. I'm Jake Brown, aka Uncle Cardboard, and I am also aka Uncle Sleepy because I just got back from New York City eating all of the paste picante sauce I could fit down my gullet. And I am so sorry that there was no live stream yesterday. It just wasn't possible to travel. I'm also sorry for that reference that was just for anybody that was born in the 80s. Also, I love that they called it paste picante sauce because I don't think America knew what salsa was yet. I think our relationship for most Americans and Mexican food was just Taco Bell. And that's great. <laughs> onto the fire sauce and moldy sour cream of Innistrad Crimson Vow because we're going to be talking about what's getting better and what's getting moldy here. If this is your first time checking out an episode of Five Up, Five Down, what I do is I break down all of the cards that are rising and falling according to 17lands.com Game in Hand Win Rate. Game in Hand Win Rate is essentially just, was this card ever drawn? If the card was drawn, then we tell you what percentage of those games had been won. It's also based on 17lands.com user data and they tend to play better than most people. They track their analytics. You should track your analytics. It's free. It's at 17lands.com. They don't take any of your personal information. They just show when you do terribly. <laughs> If you're not very familiar with the set, what are you doing listening to this podcast? It's way too grindy for you, but you can watch along on YouTube and there is a link in the episode notes where I'll have all the cards on the screen and so it makes it very easy to follow along. First, let's do the meta update. And this was a new segment last week. I felt like it was a great segment. And look at that. We are just over a minute in and we're already Boom, segments, we're doing it. <laughs> All right, on to the meta update. Let's start with Azorius, still holding down that number one spot. Insert Austin Powers, ludicrous song uh, with 57.3% win rate. And it's also tied with Is It? So we've got these, you know, super fast, super aggro blue decks that are just playing another color, holding it down. But we also have the glorious return of Rakdos at 56.9%, nice. Uh, Rakdos was down a little bit. It's still not quite dominating the format like it was. Let's call it the LR effect, but it's still a fine deck and I would draft it if it was available ever. People are just pecking on hunting and pecking the crap out of it. We have Gruul and Boros are trailing slightly at 56.4 and 56.3% respectively. I think they're just your like tier 1.5 slash tier 2 decks at this juncture, but uh, you're getting more of your red in if you're noticing a theme. And then Orzov falls to 55.1%. It's kind of in this like tier three area. I think it's firmly that just because it's a deck that hasn't really changed much. It is what it is. Um, up next, you have like your Semic and Celestia decks that are in that like tier four. And then your bottom of the barrel are Demir and Golgari fighting uh, for their sub 54% win rates. Just gnarly. I think Demir is particularly interesting because I feel like it plays very similar to Orzov, where you're trying to play cheap creatures, you're trying to exploit them, but it's not translating into wins. And we'll get into a little bit of why very soon, perhaps even now if I check the show notes. Nope, not yet, because we're going to start with five down, down. And uh, number five in Simic, a color that we're all still trying to figure out like high waisted pants on a pug. Cradle of Safety is down for the third week in a row, crashing to a 54.5% win rate. Keep in mind, that is not terrible for Simic. That puts it just below other tricks like Massive Might and Witch's Web, but those are tricks. And I think that in general, you're getting a bigger boost off of them. This deck doesn't care about if you're doing aura things. And in general, I think that Cradle of Safety is great when you have something cheap uh, that you're playing and want to protect. If you are tapping out to cast Flourishing Hunter, then it's really hard to do anything with Cradle of Safety. Sometimes you'll be able to have one mana up for massive might, but 
you, casting a flourishing hunter and having two up is a lot to ask. So in general, I'm not too stressed out about having Cradle of Safety in these decks. It's fine, but I think you want other tricks ahead of it. Oh crap, I'm in the wrong background. Can we just do all of that like the red background wasn't on for people that are on YouTube? I'm going to cut this out for the podcast. All right. <laughs> the other thing I want to note in Simic is that a lot of your early creatures that you're trying to play, like Toxic Scorpion or Spore Crawler, you're just trying to trade. So you don't need Cradle of Safety when you ostensibly could easily cast it. So just something else to note. You want your early plays to die. You are just trying to get to that sweet, sweet late game where you're casting big things. Number four, down for the third week in a row in Golgari is Gift of Fangs with a 52.1% win rate. Now, I had speculated a few weeks ago that maybe Golgari wanted this early interaction. It apparently does not. <laughs> it's not a thing you need to worry about. This may be Rakdos still being fairly pervasive, so it's not a guaranteed removal spell. It may just be that Golgari doesn't particularly care about the other side of the board. Sure, you're going to play Bleed Dry. You may even throw in a Grizzly Ritual, uh, or you're definitely playing any Heroes Downfalls that you draft, but Golgari really isn't concerned too much about your opponent's side of the board. It wants to get value out of its mid-range cards. Sometimes it wants to just plow over things with butts, and so removal especially that like hyper cheap removal just isn't a huge part of the plan you also see wolf strike not doing as well as it does in other green decks here so i would think that you're fine just going ahead with kind of a asymmetrical game plan and doing your thing as much as possible Number three in Is It, we're looking at Blood Petal Celebrant being one of the worst creatures right now with a lowly 52.1% win rate. So it looks like you want to kind of be like Flame Breather or Bust right now in your two drop slot, but even Wretched Throng is outperforming BPC by at least one and a half percent, as many as two percent over the last three weeks, uh, excuse me, three out of four weeks. So, I mean, I think that people are hesitant to speculate on Wretched Throng, but at the end of the day, it is doing better than Blood Petal Celebrant. I'll also note that this is a card I caught like serious crap for in BPC for saying stay out of it and gruel, but it's also down for a third straight week there to a lowly 49.2 win percent. But why would you ever listen to me, Reddit? So anyway, uh, don't play Blood Puddle Celebrant in your Gruel decks and be highly suspect of it in your Is It decks. Number two, let's go to Demir, where Chill of the Grave was looking great two weeks ago at 57.2%, but it has essentially dropped about 2% every week, where it's now at 53.5%. It's basically like the Dogecoin of tempo cards for Demir right now. It's just crashing and miserably. In the top 10 commons, though, we don't have a single card that says exploit right now, um, let alone like multiple cards that would necessitate an exploit package. So I'm not excited about tempo plays. And one big thing I want to note here is that I was looking at uncommons. I'm like, oh, maybe uncommons are where you seal the deal and you really need to build around your like Diver Scob or Fell Singers, Stingers. But they're relatively flat in terms of data and, and win rate. So they're not getting any better. And we're seeing all of your common exploit creatures kind of get worse. Rod Tide Gargantua is really the only one that's holding value in the top 15. You're still seeing Doom Dissenter and Persistent Specimen kind of grouped together in the same area, but in general, I don't think that this deck cares a ton about exploiting early, and so Chill of the Grave was something that I was like, well, it's interesting if you're playing a pretty fast version of this and you need targets for your repository scobs, but in general, I think just avoid both, and you're kind of playing... Uh, uh, Demir right now as like a counters card draw and removal deck that's just going to get incidental value being more controlly over the long term so don't worry too much about doing uh, doing your exploit things and also note that Blood Craze Socialite was a card that we had pinned in Demir last week it stayed up and number one down for its fourth straight week in Azorius is 
repository scab we just talked about it it's um i i don't even think that this is a card that blue white wants i think if it was target aura instead of instant and sorcery maybe ozorius is playing it but you just you'll never cast it on curve and so you're casting this like late game hill giant which stop me if if you're excited about that if that's something that is ringing your doorbell then uh, wow I, you just don't have a lot of early spells. Um, but there is one spell that you want to be playing more of in Azorius, which will take us to our five up. Where at number five, we have Alchemist Retrieval. It's up for the fourth week in a row to a whopping 57.1% win rate in Azorius. Now, I have found this card really important on both offense and defense lately. You pay two mana, discard a card, and your opponent essentially has to like take their turn over with another card. It's one way where you're going to be playing out a lot of cheap creatures, your traveling ministers, lantern bearers, etc. But then a hook hand mariner comes down, and you're like, well, I'm now kind of losing this race a little bit. So anything that you can do to just give yourself one or two more attacks sometimes can break the game open. On the flip side, again, I think that we've talked about this enough, but you can always bounce your Disturbed Auras back to your hand, and you get the creature and aura cycle all over again. All for one blue mana, seems like a deal, seems like a card that you should be playing more of. Um, additionally, I do want to give a shout out to two other cards that have also gained for the last four weeks in Azorius, in Cruel Witness and Cradle of Safety. Uh, I think when you're looking at your uncommon and rare payoffs in Azorius, that they generally benefit from things that target them uh, and having auras in play. So like your Storm Chaser Drakes or your Brinecombers are cards that you really want to be able to hit with something. So I'm all about Cradle of Safety in that regard. Again, you're also just protecting things that you're putting all of these disturbed auras on. And then... Cruel Witness is pretty interesting. This is a deck that I found can flood a little bit, and you don't have access to blood. You do want some lands so that you can have your double spell turns where you're disturbing back an aura and still making another play, but at the end of the day, Cruel Witness just helps you filter for what you need to hit, and it also helps you bin something that maybe you just rather have the aura side right off the bat, like say a lantern bearer for example you know you just go bin that and then slap it on your brine comer you get in for two you make a spirit you feel great you do the worm at number four we have a couple big gainers in boros with ancestral anger and nurturing presence both reaching three week highs at 59.6 and 59.7 game in hand win rate respectively I think that anger is, is like, and notice this, this is Boros, right? So what we're seeing in Boros is it's getting even more aggressive, more streamlined, and you are looking for these early plays. When it comes to Ancestral Anger, I think that this is primarily an is it card, even though we're seeing it in some of these Boros and even Rakdos decks, but it's going to be fought over. So I don't think that you want to go into a draft going, all right, I'm Boros Ancestral Anger. That's just not going to happen. But what I do love about Boros is that it tends to have good ways to discard bad cards that you would draw off of an Ancestral Anger with just incidental blood that you'll be making. And so you can kind of like filter to them as well if you just need a big hit. And it plays really well with a card like Markov Waltzer, for example, where you're already giving a buff to your team. When it comes to Nurturing Presence, Again, I think that this is pretty synergistic when you're looking at being able to have a card that is going to make your early plays a little bit more relevant if you have uh, Vampire Slayer or something out that, you're like, yeah, it's fine, but it gets outclassed pretty quickly. It just can get in for like one extra attack that it shouldn't have any business getting into. I also think this speaks to Boros being a potential Flame Breather deck where if you have the right density of spells, you can make it work. And I'm looking at trying to find more of those decks and looking at, again, bringing down our curve. We talked last week about how Lacerate Flesh has been miserable in this deck. Here, I think this just reinforces that concept. At number three, up to 55.3% uh, win rate in Gruel is 
Voldaren Epicure. This is a card that I have been very down on in Gruel, but it's consistently doing well. This is its third week in a row that it's up, and basically any red card outside of Epicure and Falconrath Celebrants that are generating blood are down. And that's your Blood Petal Celebrant, your Belligerent Guest, and especially Ceremonial Knife. So what this tells me is that you may want blood either super early or super late and kind of nowhere in between where Epicure can, I, I don't think that you're crazy about a lot of your two drops. So if you just have to go turn one Epicure, turn two, pitch something so that you're hitting your Weaver of Blossoms, land drop, if you're flooded, whatever it is on turn two, that you're not necessarily mad about that, but well, Darren Epicure, I don't think is like a must have. I'm just, when it shows up at 55.3%, that's notable. And this is something that I've been definitely down on for a while. So my Mia Culpa to the Epicure. At number two, our speculative up of the week is Wedding Invitation. In is it? <laughs> you know it. Uh, this is our third week in a row that Wedding Invitation is up in blue-red, and it has a whopping 58.8% win rate. So it's good for one of the top commons in Is It right now. I think it's in this cluster when you look at the data with Ancestral Anger and Chill of the Grave. And so as more and more people are getting these Flame Breathers into their deck, they're like, well, where, where else can I get cantrips? Where can I just start ripping through my deck? And once you have two or three flame breathers on the board, then Chill of the Grave becomes great. But Wedding Invitation, I think, becomes a little bit better. And here's why. Wedding Invitation does net you a couple damage. It is an immediate cantrip, but you still have a playable card at the end of this. And so sometimes it's about throwing a couple Ancestral Angers on a creature and making it unblockable and just tipping your hat and saying GG. So... That was not one that I expected to see, but Wedding Invitation just keeps on performing. So I would definitely, if you're in the right is it build, right? Something that we have to note here is that you need to be this cantrippy flame breather deck for it to work at its best. But I would give some a shot. And then at number one, up for its fourth straight week in Orzov with a 55.7% win rate is ceremonial knife this is the only deck that ceremonial knife is gaining in and perhaps it's because there's a decent amount of life link running around i don't know and i don't like it i am a noted knife hater so uh let's make the real number one vampire slayer uh in Celestia. it is up for its third week in a row to just a respectable 53.8. This isn't like, it, it's not truly number one in the fact that it's great. It's number one in the fact that that was the order that I went in. <laughs> I do want to note that Celestia is right up there with Parish Blade Trainee. They're both humans. They're both totally fine. I think that you're getting a little bit of value off of humans broadly. Rakdos is popular, so Slayer uh, rules. dun 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 dun, dun. Let's do more Slayer things. But listen, I you are also really just needing to curve in this deck. And so when you look at this cluster of two drops, you're just going, okay, I'm, I'm simply enacting a curve and then I'm going to play some tricks and, and do straightforward Celestia things. It is what it is. Now we're gonna clean out the notebook from last week. I said, don't play Dawnheart, Disciple, and Simic as a two drop. And it dropped again. Ding. I just made my own ding noise. Should I have a bell? Should the bell just go right here? Great. Okay, there it is. Um, Toxic Scorpion does look like your play. As I mentioned earlier, it's up four straight weeks to a record high 56.2% win rate in Simic. So in Simic, keep shipping Donhart Disciple. Keep drafting Toxic Scorpion. Last week I said to consider Pyre Spawn, which dropped about a percent and is right around Gift of Fangs, Sure Strike, and Grizzly Ritual in Rakdos. So, Rakdos, do you want Pyre Spawn? Okay, maybe not a ton, but it's right in with a bunch of other playables that are getting drafted way higher. So I would consider this firmly in the home improvement category of... 
That was such a bad Tim Allen. Okay, last week I said play pointed discussion in Golgari and it fell 5.6%. <laughs> I think that this is a prime candidate for the deceiving down of the week as pointed discussion has been fairly consistent up until this point and Golgari just had a bad week overall. So that is perhaps the deceiving down of the week. Speaking of, I had wedding invitation as our deceiving down of the week in Rakdos last week, and it went back up 0.5% to an even 58% game in hand win rate. Ding. Oh, yeah. Sound effects. <laughs> okay, that's it for 5 Up, 5 Down. Coming up next week, a very special episode. We'll have friend of the pod, Twitch icon, and the funniest man in magic, Samuel, and joining as long as I can make our schedules work. But now that I've said it, He's pretty much obligated. Hi, Travis. <laughs> um, if you want to catch me streaming, it's twitch.tv slash Uncle Cardboard, where I'm going to be there way more often because guess who's not traveling for a while? It's your favorite uncle. This has been Five Up, Five Down. And as always, this is a sign-off word. Boop. Hey everybody, it's your favorite uncle, reminding you to check out the Open Draft Project, where I sit down with your favorite pros, streamers, and limited grinders. They do the exact same draft seat, and then we see what's going on in their heads. If you are brand new to draft, or you're like me and draft way too much, there's always something that you can take away from this series where we talk to some of the greatest draft minds in the world. Check it out.